What's up guys, welcome to another video brought to you by The Simple Engineer. In today's video, we're gonna talk about the idea of inversion of control and dependency injection. So before we get started, let's just dive into what exactly a dependency is. And let's assume that we have a class A and A happens to use methods from another class B. So A relies on B. That's exactly what a dependency is. A has a dependency on B. For its operation to be successful, it needs to have some instance or some copy of B inside of it. Typically in software development, you would have a class, say we have a user class, and that class needs to talk to a database like MySQL. What you would commonly see is that user would initialize a MySQL database and proceed to call methods to store information. What the inversion of control recognizes, the relationship role between the dependencies should be reversed. So instead of the user, initializing or instantiating another object, we would actually have a framework or somewhere higher up the dependency graph initialize the database instance for us and then pass it to us as a parameter. Therefore, we relinquish all responsibility of this database object and somebody just hands it to us. And that allows us to depend more on abstractions rather than concrete implementations, uh, which promotes loosely coupled architecture, flexibility, and pluggability within our code. Another way that I like to think about inversion of control is think about a lamp. You create a lamp. When we're creating a user and we are hard coding the database type, that's analogous to creating a lamp and soldering the plug to the internal wiring of an outlet. In order for you to rip that thing out and plug it into another outlet is going to be extremely difficult. Likewise, as your software grows really, really large and you have hard-coded your user objects to a specific concrete implementation of a database, it's going to be hard to rip that out and refactor it. In order to achieve this idea, that brings us to dependency injection. So instead of us newing up an object within our class, we're going to have a framework like Spring or we could write this ourselves, which is what we'll do in a minute, just initialize an object and then pass it down the dependency graph. So it's actually given to us as a parameter. And and typically, instead of relying on the hard-coded concrete implementations like MySQL, Oracle, specifically, we rely on more abstract implementations. For example, an interface such as a database. Okay, so I've written a really basic class here, so let's quickly run through this. I have a class called IOC. It stands for Inversion of Control, just a main method that initializes an instance of this class. And to keep everything simple, I've created my user and database classes in the same file. File. So we have a user class, it relies on a MySQL database, and the MySQL database, essentially, we're simulating a database, it just persists some data. Well, we need to actually initialize a user object here, so we'll just say user user equals container.new user, and now we can just call user.add and this is some data. So now if we recompile the code, you can see that MySQL has persisted, this is some data. Now the issue here is uh, actually twofold. The first issue is that if we wanted to write unit tests for this user class, it would be nearly impossible because we rely internally on a MySQL instance. Uh, so therefore it's going to be really, really hard to test the internals of this code because we can't pass in a mock instance of a database. And second, if we wanted to actually rip ourselves away from the internal implementation of connecting to MySQL and utilize another database, we can't do that because we've hard-coded our association of this user to a MySQL database instance. So what we need to do is we need to actually invert the control flow to say, instead of me handling the creation and lifecycle of this database object, I'm just gonna have some somebody else do it for me and they're just gonna pass it in to my method and therefore I don't care about it anymore. I just do what I was told to do and I use the instance of a database that was given to me. So in order to invert the control flow, we are going to pass in a MySQL database. We'll just call it database and now this becomes this.database equals database. Of course, we'll get a compilation failure because we need to pass in an instance of it. So we'll just say new MySQL database. We can rerun the code and just ensure that it does exactly what it was told to do. But now we get the benefit of testability. We can write a unit test that actually mocks the instance of this database and then we can simulate this persistence call but still test the internals of this class. 
So that's one huge benefit. Unfortunately, the customer comes in and they say, I want to use an Oracle database or a Postgres database. So we come in here and uh, let's imagine, by the way, that this, this is a very large application. So refactoring it can be very, very tedious when we hard code assumptions like using a MySQL database here, for instance. So I'm gonna create a new Oracle database and it's just going to be called Oracle database. And we will just say Oracle has persisted the data. So we would hope that we would have really loosely coupled architecture. We could come in here and just say new Oracle database and rerun the code. Unfortunately, we get a compilation error because we don't support different types of databases. We've hard coded ourselves to a MySQL database. What we need to do is we need to actually follow what the dependency inversion principle says. It says that we need to rely on abstractions rather than concrete implementations. And typically to follow suit with this principle, we need to slap an interface in between this dependency graph. So instead of having just these concrete types, we need to get a little bit more generic and create something like an interface and we'll just call it database. Database will have a just a void method that's called persist and it takes in some string data. And now we just need to say that this implements database and we can say this implements database as well. So now what we can do is instead of re relying on concrete implementations, we can rely on the more abstract type, which in this case would be a database. So we'll say database and we'll replace this with database as well. Now, all of a sudden you see that the compilation error has gone away. So we'll rerun this. And now we get Oracle has persisted some data. We could replace this with MySQL, MySQL database and rerun it. And we get MySQL has persisted some data. So now you see that we're having really, really loosely coupled uh, reliance upon these different database dependencies, uh, which allows us to have this type of pluggability. And what we're doing up here, this is dependency injection. We are passing dependencies down the control graph rather than just kind of having this black box implementation, not knowing what dependencies are being used further down that dependency graph. Let's talk about how frameworks like Spring utilize uh, dependency injection frameworks. Typically what happens is we initialize an object in some global context, some application context. Uh, and you can think of this almost like a singleton where we have one single instance of an object. And typically it's, uh, it's configured at you know, within like an XML file. Let's assume that this comment here is the XML configuration within our Spring application. And I'm gonna be very, very generic on the syntax here because I don't wanna tightly couple to any particular framework. I just wanna elucidate the ideologies that these frameworks take advantage of. Essentially what you do is you uh, create a global instance or a global context of a particular object. So uh, a lot of ways people do this, like in Spring is they'll create a bean They'll give it an ID, so we'll call this like MySQL, for example, and then we'll give it the actual class path. So let's say that it's in uh, the com.java package under MySQL. So this right here would initialize this, uh, this object for us in a global context. So we'd have a singleton available throughout our application. We could do the same thing for Oracle as well. Uh, so now we have a global instance of Oracle available throughout our application, but this is where it gets interesting. Let's say that we have a bunch of different users spread throughout our application. So in this case, I'll just write three in this piece of the application, but imagine that these users could be initialized in various places. But the user, the uh, the the user or programmer comes in here and they they need to modify user. So they come in here and they say we need to actually add another database as a parameter. So I come in here and I will call this database two, and we will pass in uh, another database reference call it database two. And you've seen that in the code, we've actually broken this completely. This is really problematic because if we had initialized these user objects by hand, a lot of places in our, in our program, we've broken the main API and that, that can be really problematic. So what dependency injection frameworks allow us to take advantage of is we could actually initialize uh, this these user objects uh, in one single place. So I could come in here and I could say bean ID equals user. I'll give it a class. We'll call it com.java.user, for example. And it will take in different uh, different types of databases. So in this case, we take in two databases very generically. And so what I, we can do here, we can pass in a reference type. So we can say something like argref equals, and then we can pass in either two MySQL types, or we could pass in uh, you know, a reference to this Oracle type. And these reference types are pointing to these already initialized beans. 
and this is really, really cool. So now if I want to, you know, these are all basically the same user objects. What I would do instead is I would get rid of this. So I'm not actually managing the initialization here in my code either. I come in here and I just add an annotation. So like in spring, I say auto wired and you can basically place this down the chain here. And what spring will do is it will auto initialize these user objects based on the bean that we have here. Um, and this is a really, really good way to handle your dependencies. So even though I've changed the parameters of this user constructor, they're going to get auto wired and auto configured based on this uh, context of our configuration, this container management system that we use. Uh, and it will inject the dependencies for us automatically. So although we can do this manually, uh, this is some of the benefit that you get from utilizing a dependency injection container. Um, so that pretty much covers it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. Please subscribe and like the video. Thanks.